Hello, I'm Father Mitch Pacwa, and welcome to EWTN Live. We're bringing you guests from around the world, and tonight we'll talk about the inspiring Catholic literary character, Mr. Blue, who led many readers to embrace their Christian faith and lead a life of service. After he came to life on the printed page in 1928, he became the antithesis to F. Scott Fitzgerald's The Great Gatsby. And we're going to talk about that. But before we do, I'd like to talk with EWTN's own Len Marino, who is not The Great Gatsby. He's going to teach us a little bit about EWTN's creative services and what they're up to. Len? What are you all doing up there? Good to see you, Father. Well, we have uh, made some changes and improvements on our EWTN app. Mm -hmm. And uh, we're going to you know, kind of go through some stuff. But our EWTN app, you can uh, watch live stream. You can watch on demand. You can see all of our news programs. There's even a portion, uh, there's even a part of the app where you can read the Bible. You can even get an audio Bible. And it's pretty darn complete. And like I said, and the ad says it's more than just a new coat of paint. So why don't we roll it and some folks will you know, find out more about it. The best Catholic app just got better. And it's more than just a new coat of paint. The new EWTN app lets you watch, rent, or purchase programs through our expanded on-demand library, which includes hundreds of free titles, and stream any EWTN channel while on the go, including one devoted to live Eucharistic adoration. You can also read the latest Catholic news right at your fingertips, or delve into the in-app Bible with new updated reading and navigation tools. It's all in one place, one app, EWTN. Download for free today. So that about says it all, but if uh, they, we also, we, you can get it at EWTNapps.com. You can go to your smartphone's uh, store, app store, and uh, it's available on any smartphone, any platform. And yeah. like I said, it's uh, good. In fact, if they put up the, there's the website up there at EWTNapps.com, you know, you can see how to download it and, uh, you know, you're able to, uh, you know, enjoy it after that. So that, anything? Yeah, that's... You have it. You have it on yours. I do. I do have it on mine. And, you know, I know a number of folks have said to me, you know, that they're uh, really strained financially about having cable anymore and things like that. This is what you can still watch us. Yeah, and it's and, free. And let, you, and let your friends know that even if they don't have cable, they can take a look at this app and continue to learn more about our Catholic faith. All right. Thanks, Len. Appreciate Welcome. it. Welcome. We're going to be back in just a couple of minutes with tonight's guest, so please stay with us. Thank you and welcome back. We have a guest tonight who is here to shed new light on a remarkable Catholic writer and filmmaker named Miles Conley. He wrote a novel in 1928 called Mr. Blue. It was a retelling of the story of St. Francis of Assisi, except instead of Italy, it was set in New York and Boston in the Roaring Twenties and it framed the practice of the Catholic faith not as a chore or duty, but a joyful challenge and a bold adventure. Then, Miles Connolly moved to Hollywood, where he wrote and produced over 40 films, weaving Catholic virtues into several of his screenplays with help of legendary director Frank Capra. Here to tell us more about the life and work of Miles Connolly, please welcome from 
Benedictine College in Atchison, Kansas, Dr. Stephen Mirachi. Dr. Hey, Stephen, good, good to, to you. have you. Thank welcome, you. welcome, welcome, welcome. Thank you. And, you know, uh, something we talked about when you came in yesterday, um, I was required to read Mr. Blue in high school it, uh, as a freshman. Mm. You know, we had to read four novels uh, every summer, mm. you know, in between years and even before we started freshman year. And I remember Mr. Blue in particular because it was the first time I ever read a novel where I went, wow, that was amazing. Mm. You know, it, it was just a great little novel. It's not very long, no. mm -hmm. but it's, it's just very, has a great pack. Tell us more about Miles Connolly, the author, before we get into the novel, Mr. Blue. Yeah, sure. So it, for a long time, the novel was required reading in colleges and high schools. Yeah. Now that was sometime around the late 1940s, early 1950s. Uh, 1960s too now. Sure, yeah. <laughs> it got in there. Don't want to make Just you too so old there, Father. Just so nobody gets carried away with my old age. <laughs> and he, yeah, he wrote, he wrote the book in 28, as you said, and Great Gatsby had come out in 1925. And F. Scott Fitzgerald at that point uh, had made a name for himself as a bit of a playboy and also as someone who was not satisfied with the Catholic faith. Yeah, yeah, because Scott Fitzgerald, as you might imagine from that name, uh, was Catholic. Right, but... But not quite, living it. No, and even more so, he was actively critiquing it. Mm -hmm. So there's a, a short story of his, for instance, in which he replicates the Latin of the Mass and even of the words of confession of the time, but has his character reject it and reject the offer of mercy, and this caused a bit of scandal, as you can imagine. Sure. Uh, and Connolly loved to read. He was a very avid reader. In fact, one of someone who did some research into Connolly said that maybe his love of books was the only thing that competed with his love of his wife. So this is how much he loved reading. Yeah. Uh, and so John Breslin, the Jesuit, was the first person in essay form to say, I think Mr. Blue is a response to Gatsby, and he provided some evidence in this regard as mm -hmm. to why. And I picked up on that and provided some more evidence when I started putting together the, mm -hmm. the annotated edition in this sense. Because, you know, so folks understand, wh what is the theme of the great Gatsby? Sure. Right. So a lot of people see it as his frustration with the downfall of the American dream. A lot of people see it as why this, this Gatsby character seems to be stuck in the past this is why he's a bit blue at the beginning of the book. He seems to be obsessed with a past love. And he tries to make it happen again, but he can only make it happen again through adultery. Mm -hmm. And so he gets, uh, and even in the, Fitzgerald crafts the novel so that in one of the, in chapter seven, where the climax of the novel is happening, there is quite literally a wedding happening in the hotel below them while this adulterous relationship is about to explode above them. Mm -hmm. Okay, so you have the white. Remember I said the blue, we have the white. Mm -hmm. And then at the end, when it all falls apart, because that's what happens when you try to relive the past, mm -hmm. we have Gatsby literally floating in a pool and Fitzgerald shows the trail of blood going into the drain. Mm -hmm. And this is what some people interpret as also Fitzgerald's view of Catholicism. Mm -hmm. Catholicism is dead in the water. It is no longer meaningful to us. Mm -hmm. past World War I, past in our current condition. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's interesting, um, you know, that uh, he would write after the war because this is also a phenomenon. After the, the first and after the second World Wars, there was this real disillusionment with humanity. Yes. And people were expressing that in various ways, and mm -hmm. I think that that's a key part of Fitzgerald. That's uh, right. People just didn't know how to pull their world world back or hold it together after something so catastrophic uh, had occurred. We quite, we see this quite literally in Eliot's great poem, The Wasteland, where you have. Uh, some scholars describe that as an exploded library. There are so many literary references and allusions going on there, but they're just scattered throughout mm -hmm. the poem as if all of humanity's knowledge and wisdom has been 
exploded yes. in this sense. Yes. You know, Elliot went on to do very different things after that, as you know. Right. But so the idea here is that Connolly read that and said, oh, no, you don't, Fitzgerald. Mm. <laughs> Connolly said, uh uh. And it, Connolly was uh, a very uh, devout Catholic. He was a daily mass goer, he loved his faith. Uh, his graduating class, he was salutatorian of his class at Boston College. Uh, but even being number two salutatorian, his graduating class said of him, no, he is a debater without peer. Mm -hmm. You're not gonna win an argument with Connolly. Mm -hmm. he, even at a place that was at that point quite famous for its Catholic identity. Yeah. So, uh, so he crafts, remember I said the kind of red, white, and blue of the structure of Gatsby. And, and actually Fitzgerald re wanted to name the novel under the red, white, and blue at the last minute, but his publisher wisely said no. <laughs> yeah. The great Gatsby fits a little better, right? Yeah. But so Connolly also structures the book in a blue, white, and red fashion, except now it's not blue because I'm sad of something I lost, it's blue because I'm living my vocation, but there's something more that God wants me to do. White, when he becomes fully uh, like a white martyrdom, like we like is spoken about in the church, I'm living my vocation fully. I'm giving myself in, to love of God and love of neighbor. And maybe you might have the red, and for those who haven't read it, I'll um, not spoil that point. Right. But in other words, what Connolly saw as Fitzgerald doing, saying, Blue, white, and red. See, the American dream is dead. We need something new. Mm -hmm. Connolly saying, the American dream's not dead. What we need is a revolution of the spirit. See, this is, I think, uh, an extremely important perspective for us to discuss in these days. Mm -hmm. I'm, you know, just today on radio, people, uh, I you know, had an email from a uh, a woman who's from Uvalde, Texas, oh, dealing with man. all that. Yeah. Another man whose son died of um, drug overdose. Mm -hmm. And, you know, a number of other problems that people were talking about. Sure. And the temptation is going to be uh, in a few directions. One, the world must be is so bad, Lord, just bring it to an end. Bring the second coming... I give up. I, I want out of here. Yeah. Other people say, I want out of here. That's why I'm using drugs. Mm. That's why I'm depressed. Mm. And other people are, are, who return to the core of their faith are going to do like Connolly. We have to have a spiritual revolution. And it's our spirituality that makes the change, our commitment to Christ, our faith in him. Yes. This is, these are some of the options we have, and I fear too many Catholics are getting disheartened mm. instead of saying there are huge problems, let's hunker down and take them on. Yeah, and that's exactly what Connolly has his characters do. And I would say in a distinctly American way as well, which is what's so enticing about Connolly's books. So for instance, in Mr. Blue, one of the pivotal scenes in which the title character Blue begins to take on more of his vocation to get to that white stage, as we might say, mm -hmm. where he's living a white martyrdom. So Connolly has them walk f from a, a particular place in Boston near the old oyster house, almost a, which is one of the oldest places in the establishment of the area. And he has them walk past Faneuil Hall and the old, uh, the old uh, courthouse. In other words, all these places where wonderful things in the American Revolution happened, the reading of the Declaration of Independence. Mm -hmm. And when he gets to the end, he and the narrator get to the end of their walk, Blue hands him a St. John Vianney prayer card that says the cross is the gift that God gives to his friends. And at that mm -hmm. point, he takes up his cross. So Connolly, in a very literary and aesthetic way, says, look at their walk that they're taking. The walk that they're taking is they're redoing the American Revolution. What is the spirit of the American Revolution? It is to take up that gray cross and bear it well. Mm -hmm. And this is something that Connolly is going to emphasize in all his books that mm -hmm. he, and Connolly would say that only Christianity can really offer you the substantial truth of redemptive suffering. Mm -hmm. uh, that, and it, it was no accident that the uh, first great awakening, a major religious revival mm -hmm. had preceded the American Revolution by a few years. Mm -hmm. And people were 
reinvigorated in their Christian faith in that revival, mm -hmm. and that helped to guide where they were going in the revolution, mm -hmm. as opposed to the French Revolution, mm -hmm. which was atheistic and became viciously violent mm -hmm. against citizens. Right. I have a quote from mm. um, Mary Connolly Briner. Yeah. Uh, she is the daughter of Miles Connolly. Yes. Uh, in fact, she had asked me some time ago to do a program mm. on this. Mess. We're glad to have you. Yay. But uh, Connolly's daughter, Mary, had said, and a quote, Mr. Blue worried back in the 1920s about how young people would keep their faith in an imagined time, a century into the future when the world might be indifferent to faith and be set with religious intolerance. Now, we're living in the, that century later. We are. And we're seeing that. We are. You know, um, religious conversation is forbidden by the Supreme Court. You, Supreme Court doesn't allow the Ten Commandments to even be displayed, yet alone taught. Mm -hmm. And uh, the Supreme Court also took prayer and scripture reading and moments of silence out of schools in 1962. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's just continued to grow as groups like the um, American Civil Liberties Union mm -hmm. pushes hard to remove any religious content in the public forum. Mm. So she was right that, that 100 years after, this is what's going on. And you know the, the centerpiece of Mr. Blue, quite literally in the center of the novel, is the Catholic Mass. Yes. And it's in a dystopian setting. It's the movie that Blue says, this is what's going on. This is a movie I, idea I have. And he tells the narrator. And it is, it's, it's a dystopia. And quite interestingly, you know, for 1928, that's pretty far ahead of just about and, the major dystopias that would come. Yeah, what, yeah. what did he describe that dystopia? That yeah, sure, so it's, uh, it's, and Connolly would return to this theme in a number of his books. Connolly knew that scientism, not good science, but the reduction of science to only the empirical, that's what I'm calling scientism, mm -hmm. would be a major threat to humanity mm -hmm. coming soon. Mm -hmm. And thus he imagines, uh, almost like uh, if you've seen the movie The Matrix, it's only, he imagines a matrix-like society where machines are in control to a certain extent. There are maybe, there's maybe a ruling class, but everything is machinated. Mm -hmm. uh, people drink and eat only two fluids. People are assigned numbers. There is no religious faith of any kind. Everything has been made this end. But he tells the story of the one Catholic who has hidden his faith and goes about making the bread, quite literally from seed, to make a Eucharist. Right, he grew wheat from seed. To make the Eucharist and from. And grew grapes. And then he finally, having brought everything together, and he makes the, he does the wine as well, and he makes all the, uh, this is one of the great parts of the book, Connolly describes in beautiful detail all of the vestments of a priest. Of course, in this time, it would include things like the maniple. And he, in other words, this character in this dystopia does everything correctly in this sense. He doesn't just put a mishmash of what he can together. No, he goes to the effort of making sure he has the chasuble, the alb, the maniple, the bread, the wine. And then he does the mass. And this, he, because he knows, yeah. this is the only thing that can save this world, right. is to bring Christ substantially right. into the world, not symbolically. Yeah. No, this and is... the, the great fun of the book is that, that Connolly loves to give us surprises. He loves to give us an unexpected twist. And what he ends up doing with the Mass is he quite inadvertently brings the end of time. <laughs> yeah, right, right. That's, that was one of those moments as he did that, you know, that um, the, the, the priest celebrates Mass and people are clamoring to destroy him and the we, mass. We have to stop it, right? Right. They can't stand it. And the, you know, the idea that the the mass is so intolerable, very much the way 
we hear many people in our own society today who consider our faith intolerable. We can't have it. We have to remove it. Mm -hmm. And they're not open at all. And mm -hmm. he sees that. And then finally, Christ comes because of that final mass on yes. earth and brings the end of time. Right. It's a powerful scene. It's, it's, and it, it again shows Connolly understood you have to do these things the right way. Mm -hmm. And when you do them, I mean, the, the, like I said, the detail that he describes all the vestments with, it's, it's beautiful. Mm -hmm. And he, he of course, he includes the Latin. He's like, oh, yeah, Fitzgerald, you're not the only one who gets to include the Latin here. Right. <laughs> I know it too. Right. So, but he says, but when you do it right, this is what happens. Right. You quite literally, and this is going to be, and it's a very funny moment because the narrator says, oh, well, he should have been a bishop. He can't really. <laughs> yeah. and the narrator has these kind of theological quibbles with him about it. Yeah. And the narrator says, yeah, well, but wouldn't it make a great movie? And this, I, I think this, this is something that Connolly really believed in, was beauty proper with the good, the true, and the beautiful. Mm -hmm. Beauty proper, in other words, telling a good story because it's a good story mm -hmm. and telling it well is a way to bring God to earth. Yes. Connolly believed that. Yes. Heart and soul. And you see it in all of his books. There's this constant theme of a story well told by the way that stories are, again, aesthetics, using the techniques we know that make good stories. Yeah. It's going to be the way. As a matter of fact, Miles Connolly has a, a great quote he had written in the pilot, which was the Catholic newspaper, the Archdiocese in Boston, of Boston, yeah. and he wrote back in 1951, I quote, to me, a book is ca Catholic if it tells in concrete terms man's relation to his God and to his soul. Why can't some of our writers talk more about the adventure of Catholicism? Mm. I I think that that part is very key today. Mm -hmm. You know, with you know uh, churches being desecrated, statues being attacked mm -hmm. of the Blessed Mother mm -hmm. and uh, you know different saints uh, around the country just a couple of years ago, and now uh, the pro-abortion mm -hmm. uh, folks who are upset about the Supreme Court reversing. Roe v. Wade mm -hmm. are threatening churches, mm -hmm. all this. This is not something to make us cower. That's what they want. To, oh, no, mm -hmm. we can't have that happen. No, we have to sit up and enter the adventure of our Catholic faith and not cower behind, uh, away from them. And that's what Connolly's characters do. Yes. They, I, it's no mistake that Connolly worked with Capra on some of those great movies like State of the Union, mm -hmm. in which that have these type of themes of courage in the face yes. of persecution. Sure. But the, that Connolly was probably one of the first and foremost advocates for G.K. Chesterton in America. Is that he, right? Yeah. He's, it's the more, uh, and I, I sent some of the books to Dale Alquist, you know, the head of the Chesterton Society in America. Mm -hmm. And he read them and he said to me, and he said, I want you to quote this. These are the most Chestertonian books not written by Chesterton. Yeah. <laughs> so for, for Dale to say that is a big deal, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and it's, and it's true. Uh, Connolly loved Chesterton. He, was, uh, he met Chesterton when he came for his first visit to America in 21. He covered oh, yeah. it in his newspaper uh -huh. columns. And he was constantly referencing Chesterton throughout his books. But as you know, Chesterton, especially in Orthodoxy and then his other books, he talks about the great adventure. Yes. Of Christianity. Exactly. And this involves courage, but it also, and this is the really key thing. It, it's key for Connolly and Chesterton both. Adventure means risk. Exactly. A venture capitalist is someone who risks it. Right. You, you have to go out. You're, yes, you have certitude, but you don't have absolute certitude in this sense. And you have to risk it. You have to go out there and. And the other side of it, too is you have to be willing to take on dangerous situations. That's it. That's it. You know, this, uh, you know, in the early church, being a bishop was a very dangerous risk. It was a death sentence. 
Yeah. And being pope was always a death sentence. No. Great risk was uh, involved. This is what we do, and not just let's be, oh no, I'm scared. Yes, yeah, so uh, <laughs> most heroes are when they're in battle, but even when you're scared, you keep going forward. That's right. And that's that's where you know this courage comes into play. Yeah, I, today's the feast of Saint Justin Martyr. Yeah. whose writings we still have. What yes. a treasure that is. Uh, but one of Connolly's great, no and his favorite novel that he wrote was Dan England and the Noonday Devil. Mm -hmm. And that book is, it's the of, it's my favorite as well. It's so, as much as I love Mr. Blue, Dan England and the Noonday Devil is theologically rich and it covers and confronts one of the most mature spiritual problems that any of us will face, the problem of acedia. Mm -hmm. or spiritual we, yeah, sloth. Yeah, t talk yeah. about the seed. What does that mean? Yeah, so quite literally spiritual sloth, but not necessarily, it can be a kind of laziness, but it can also be a kind of restlessness or overactivity in lesser goods. In other words, you know, some, some people think of Christianity as, well, I'm just gonna be struggling against temptations my whole life. As long as I avoid temptations and do good, then that's the adventure. And I thought, no, that's not quite it. The adventure is when, yes, you have your temptations mostly under control. You're never going to have them fully under control, maybe, right? But now you have to choose between lesser goods and greater goods. Mm -hmm. And boy, is that tough because giving up a lesser good is still giving up a good. That's yes. a hard thing to do. And that's what Dan England does in that book. So Connolly gives us, again, a very well-crafted story of what it means for someone to be doing a lot of good but he knows there's a greater good to be done. And to tie it back to what you said earlier, it involves a leap of courage mm -hmm. for Dan. And Connolly actually ties it into a post-war uh, group, the Forest Brothers in the Baltic states mm -hmm. when, uh, after the Russian occupation of that area. Mm -hmm. And he, so he brings in a little bit of his history there. He was uh, in, the, in the Navy himself, Connolly. So he brings in these themes every now and then. Sure. Yeah. And I, I think to, to see um, this adventure mm. that is part of what we're called to um, in choosing greater goods mm. um, is part of our stance today. We don't always know what to do. There are a lot of problems. Mm. You know, the, the violence, the, the people dying of drug overdoses, mm. there are so many difficulties. and. None of us can handle all of them. Right. None of us can right. fix the whole problem. Right. But all of us have to take courage and do what we can with, in mind, and I think this discernment among goods mm, is mm -hmm. how do we seek to do the greater glory to God? Mm -hmm. What do we seek to give greater glory to God? You know, they're, mm. they're, everything is good. Mm -hmm. But what gives greater glory to God in what I choose? This is key. Right, right. And in Mr. Blue, Connolly will say the evangelical councils are, and this might seem a little radical for the 1920s, but he'll say the evangelical councils can be practiced by lay people. In other words, mm -hmm. taking up poverty, chastity, obedience. And the, the layman, Blue, makes a vow to Lady Poverty, quite like St. Francis of Assisi did, right. but he does it as a layman. And he eventually comes to give everything, and he goes to live with the poorest of the poor in Boston by becoming poor himself. Mm -hmm. Does that sound like Mother Teresa? Does that yeah. sound like Catherine Drexel? Does that and sound like, okay. Francis of Assisi. Of course, but, yeah. that, but then he's a lay person. He's a layman doing these things. And uh, I've just, I, was, I recently heard from a Catholic worker named James Murphy who was doing a documentary on Peter Morin. And he said, I've, I found something that I think you should know. He said, I, we know that Peter Morin read Mr. Blue. That is, I, I'd always suspected, mm -hmm. but I'd, I'd never had proof, evidentiary proof. He said, second, Peter Morin sent a letter to Miles Connolly saying, I, could you, since you have such great journalistic background and you clearly understand the faith very well, would you be interested in helping with this little newspaper 
I'm starting. Mm -hmm. <laughs> this has become one of the most famous newspapers in the history of the faith. Yeah. <laughs> the, 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 the penny newspaper that people joked about, it was carried on, uh, on the back of a horse cart past St. Patrick's Cathedral and the horse genuflected. I mean, that's a very famous story about yeah. that paper. <laughs> yeah. the, but Miles Connolly might have been the person working on that paper, but for whatever reason, it didn't come to fruition. And someone named Dorothy Day ended up helping on the paper uh -huh. instead. And as you know, was brought to, now she's servant of God. Yeah. as a result. But so that Catholic worker movement that again has this mission of saying, yes, you can serve the poorest of the poor as a layman, a laywoman, a layperson. Mm -hmm. You can do that mm -hmm. and come to great holiness in your state of life. And even if you don't do exactly that, say you yeah, have a sure. family, yeah. there are a variety of ways that families need to live chastity and obedience and poverty, and po yes. Um, all these virtues are, you know, that fit one's family um, and family life. This is something all of us can can work on. Absolutely. We have, yeah. we have to take a little break. Sure. But we're going to be back. We want to get some of your questions and comments. So please stay with us. Welcome back. We are talking to Dr. Stephen Marachi, and you can read more of his work and reflection uh, on his website, which is xcorde.org. So it's e x c o r d e dot org. Xcorde.org, and it's named after the great document by Pope Saint John Paul, Ex Corde Ecclesiae. Uh, on the universities. So get that. And also, if you are interested in getting Mr. Blue and some of the other books by Miles Conley, you can go to cloonymedia.com. Cloonymedia.com. That'd be great. Uh, way to get some of these novels, and if you you haven't read them, um, uh, I strongly urge that if your kids haven't read them, these would be terrific to ha to get. You ready for some questions? Let's do it. Let's start off with a caller. Hello, is this Mary Connolly Briner? Yes, it is, Father. How are you? This so our audience again remembers oh. you are the daughter of yes. Miles Connolly, correct? Yes, I am. That's correct, Father. Yes. Well, thank you so much for uh, taking the time to call us. Oh, Father, I've been so looking forward to this program. I'm so happy and grateful to you for introducing my dad to so many new people today. I hope he makes lots of new friends. I do, too, because, again, the book is wonderful. And you know, it's it's not something you have to be, uh, uh, you know, an old guy in his 70s like, like <laughs> I. You can, you know, this is, I read it as a teenager and loved it. Yes, it's very much for the young, isn't it? Yes. Very idealistic and promising and joyful. Yes. It really is, yes. Good. And I, I wanted to thank Dr. Morarchi also, Father, for his wonderful research and his affection and his wisdom for all the characters that he annotated and, and worked on and wrote about. Mm -hmm. So thank you very much. Well, thank oh, you yeah. for calling. Yeah, total. It's so good to hear your voice after emailing you for all these years, Mary. This is the first time we, I, I've actually heard your voice. It's so wonderful. I look forward to meeting you in person sometime. And I, what a, I, this, uh, I had not heard of the book until I started teaching at Benedictine. Uh -huh. And a student, just like you know, you said, a student came to me and said, "Have you heard of this book, Mr. Blue? He's he seems like a really joyful guy, but he seems kind of reckless. I'm not sure what to think." And I hadn't read it, and 
who would have known five years later, here I am working on all yeah. of his books. So I, what a, what a, what a, I'm, I say, I'm thankful. Yeah. Thank you. All right. Well, thank you very much for calling in. And we have a studio uh, audience question. Sir, where are you from? Uh, originally from uh, outside Chicago and right now residing in central Florida. Great. And yeah. what is your question or comment? Uh, how many novels did Connolly write and do most of them, all of them, have a theological theme to them? Okay. So there are four novels and one collection of short stories. But there are a lot of uncollected stories that he wrote that are not necessarily theological, but they did have spiritual implications. So, for instance, Connolly had a story that I believe was in Ladies Home Journal at the time. I'm going to have to go back and check. But it's a story about how a, a, the character is searching in his life and he's not quite sure what to do and so he goes to what he thinks is going to be a psychologist but that ends up making him worse <laughs> and, and by the end of the story everything works out nicely but he what, what it, the story is obvious it's not explicitly theological but it is a warning of Connolly by putting too much of one's trust, mm -hmm. one's religious trust in a non-religious solution. In fact, you know, in the first part, first half of the 20th century, maybe longer uh, into the 70s, it was becoming assumed that psychologists mm. would replace priests. Mm. And most, you know, Freud and you know hated religion, mm. and he he thought of the psychologist as replacing the religious figure, religious leader, mm. um, and uh, uh, it was interesting years later to read Carl Gustav Jung, the oh, Swiss psychologist, yeah. mm. who said, fewer than two percent of my clients are practicing Catholics <laughs> because they don't need me. Mm. He actually saw that the confessional took care of most of what was going on in his psychological practice. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's some things that have to be dealt with psychologically. Sure, sure, yeah. But it's not going to replace religion. You know, interestingly enough, the great American author who also said something like that was Nathaniel Hawthorne. When he took a trip to to Rome near the end of his life, he saw the confessionals at St. Peter's Inn and the priests offering confession in how many different languages, sure. right? Yeah, right. at least 15, 20, maybe even right. 30 languages. And he remarked at that time, Nathaniel Hawthorne, he said, I really wish I could believe this because this seems to me to solve one of humanity's biggest problems. Right. The need to expiate guilt. Right. Now, someone in his family obviously heard that, Rose Hawthorne, who's now servant of God. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that was now his daughter. Oh, okay. Yeah. So. Oh, that's right. Yeah. That's right. We did a show yeah. about that some years ago. Yeah. One of the things that I use, I, I mentioned this to Dr. Ray Gurendi. Oh, yeah. yeah he's, he's great. Yeah, he is. And we would, I told him that my view of psychologists is that they're like a good hunting dog, good bird <laughs> dog, that you put a bird dog out in the field and he goes sniffing around for the birds and he's really good at finding what the, the hunter can't because mm. we don't know how to find certain things. And psychologists really do a good job of mm. finding certain things. And then when he comes up on a bird, he becomes absolutely still, just points. Mm. And then when the hunter's ready, he flushes them and shoots them down. And I think of that as a, a good way to understand the relationship with Christ. Mm. The psychologist can find these problems, but it takes Christ to flush them out and shoot them, so mm. to speak. By analogy, don't worry about <laughs> shooting anybody. Now, this, um, to, to just uh, build on that and what the, um, the person was asking the question, there's... One of Connolly's short stories is actually very good in this regard. You know, in the 1950s, people like Flannery O'Connor were becoming quite popular. This yes. is a whole new kind of religious storytelling. Yes. It was, wow, uh, okay, I'm, 
one of the best parts of her letters is when she says she's getting ready to write the story Greenleaf, and she says, I've got, I've got this woman with these bull's horns in her guts. That's the story. Now I have to figure out the rest of the story. <laughs> That's what yeah. she started with. Yes. The moment of violent grace, right? So Connolly actually tried his hand at that kind of story and I think did a very good job of it. In fact, it's one of my favorite stories of his. It's called The Pigeon from St. Bartholomew's and it's mm -hmm. quite, it's very much about this kind of let's hunt out what the problem is. Mm -hmm. And he traces this character who is the opposite of Mr. Blue in almost every way. Mm -hmm this and what he flushes out is that this character believes only in abstract symbols he does not believe in reality so Connolly's solution is to bring him to the eucharist <laughs> the, to the the substantial the reality of realities mm -hmm. unfortunately the character flees <laughs> And there's a, I won't spoil the ending of it because it's actually quite a humorous ending mm -hmm. uh, in line with Connolly's method of storytelling. But it, again, it's, Connolly was able to use different types of storytelling to get across that fundamental truth, as he said, with a dose of humor. Now, one of the ways in which Connolly does this is not only in novels, but in his Hollywood work. Uh, yeah, definitely. And What's his most famous movie that he yeah, wrote right. with Frank so, Copra? Uh, probably the one he's uncredited for, sadly, to this day. is yeah, He wrote several scenes from It's a Wonderful Life. Yeah. Everybody he wrote what? several of the scenes in that movie. And sadly, he was uncredited at the time. Uh, I, uh, Frank Capra went to Connolly's funeral. And uh, one of the members of the family, Christopher Connolly, had told me that he's seen a legal deposition in which Capra said, Connolly helped me on everything, mm -hmm. which again, coming from Capra is a big admission. If you've read Capra's autobiography, you know how larger than life Capra was, and yeah. he knew he was larger than life, but that's his, that's his uh, persona. Yeah, yeah right. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but so for Capra to say this man helped me with everything, especially when they had such a kind of love, um, not so love relationship at times. But, but you see in, you know, uh, a story like uh, uh, this, that there are, um, you know, this trying to do the right thing and struggling against, mm -hmm. you know, being heroic against the forces yeah. that would destroy and looking at the possibilities of what could happen or with me or without me. Right. This right. is, you know, uh, part of that uh, imaginative sense. Yes. And he also helped with another one of Copper's great movies, Mr. Smith goes to Washington. Yes, right. Same kind of thing, State going of the Union, up against, same, yeah. you know, the this the, the what we call today the Washington Swamp, <laughs> you know, and you know just dealing with that. Uh, that the, this these kind of themes show up in the movies they that do. Connolly worked on. Yeah, and the the movie that he worked on that got the most Academy Award nominations, not one for him, sadly. He did get an Academy Award nomination for Music for Millions, that movie. Okay. Uh, that he I, he, I believe he wrote the story. Uh, it might be the screenplay. Let me let me check. But it was he got the a nomination on that. But the the movie that he worked on that got the most um, nominations was his. Uh, treatment of Hans Christian Andersen, that movie that came out in 52, if I remember correctly. Oh, okay. And But again, it's not just Hans Christian Andersen, the, the, the myth or fable teller. It is the person who truly pulled from that reservoir of divine love in creating these stories. Mm -hmm. And that's what Connolly uh, emphasizes yes. in that film. And we do know a lot of Hans Christian Andersen's tales have this deep spiritual element to them. The Traveling Companion, for instance, that mm -hmm. one is not one that you hear too much about, but that one presents burying the dead as a corporal work of mercy. And Andersen himself was a Lutheran, yeah. uh, which is, again, what a, what a beautiful idea to be telling in a, in a fairy tale. Mm -hmm. and, but again, this is what Connolly emphasizes. And, and he, I'm sure that he was attracted to Hans Christian Andersen as a subject yeah. because it's something what he was doing right. with his writing as well. Yeah, no, that's true. He, the, uh, the last book that he wrote is actually three novellas 
And they're about three very different people. One, a priest who is pursuing perfection in the Carmelite tradition. His sister, by the way, was a Carmelite. A, and she was in the, Carma, the monastery up in Concord, New Hampshire, which quite sadly closed down two years ago. Mm. But he would go and visit her every year without fail. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so he was very attracted to the Carmelite spirituality for this reason. So, yeah. And anyway, in Three Who Ventured, you have these three no uh, novellas, one about a priest pursuing perfection in a Carmelite way, one, a husband, we we're talking about the married vocation, the husband who has many children, it's wonderful, and <laughs> deals with a horrible tragedy. And he has to, how do I deal with this horrible tragedy? Oh, sure. And then finally, a kind of Graham Greene, Evil and Waugh kind of story in which we get into the mind of a murderer who decides to repent. Mm -hmm. And it, it, it is very much of that, can he repent? What does repentance mean for someone like this? Mm -hmm. And he wanted to, originally to call the book uh, The Mansions as a reference to, in my father's house, there are many mansions. Mm -hmm. In other words, there are mansions for each of these people. Sure. But he ended up calling it Three Who Ventured. We were talking about adventure, right? right? In other words, all three of them end up taking risks one seeking perfection, one seeking, uh, again, that vocation through redemptive suffering in the family, and the final one taking a risk on God's mercy. Mm. So th those are themes that he very much and, valued. W and it's called, the book is called again? That's Three Who Ventured. Three Who Ventured. ventured. Yeah, that so was his that's... last book. And quite sadly, it's uh, the least well-known of his, but it contains some of his most mature writing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. To look for that. Yeah. We have another caller online. Mm -hmm. Jim? Yes. Hi, Father Hi. Mitch. How are you? Fine. Where are you calling from? I'm calling from Ojai, California. And oh, uh, I was on the uh, Israel trip that you took in 2015. Oh, great. Oh, good. Well, it's nice to hear from you again then. Yes. So what can we good. do for you this fine day? Uh, well, I was calling for uh, Steve to please expound on his motivation for reintroducing Miles Connolly and Truth, Beauty, and Goodness to the world. He told us that a student brought him the book, and yeah. I would like to know a little bit more about the process of thinking that got him to launch this wonderful series of books. Mm. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. So yeah why, so, did you, why did this capture you, and what, what motivated you? Sure. Okay, so did you ever have that experience? It's a rare one. Maybe it's not so rare for more intelligent people like you, Father. <laughs> but for me, it is. <laughs> but when you, you read a book and on almost every other page, you say, I know what he means. Mm -hmm. In other words, you find yourself underlining, you find yourself bracketing, mm -hmm. you find yourself making notes. And by the end of the book, you say, wow, I feel like I've really got this one. Mm -hmm. it's a real, that's how I felt after reading Mr. Blue. Mm -hmm. that's, and I said, I really think I, I, I think I, and again, that's because I'd been reading a lot of Chesterton, I think. At the time, I didn't know that Connolly was so into Chesterton, but I'd been reading a lot of Chesterton, so I was immediately attracted to that Chestertonian quality. Mm -hmm. So then I decided to start teaching it in my classes as, again, this is a momentous uh, publication in, in uh, I would say, in American literature, especially because it's one of the first great Catholic best-selling books that is respectful of the Catholic faith, right? But then it, it went out of print again. Um, Amy Wellborn had done a fantastic job with the Loyola Classics series, yes. uh, but then they, um, they stopped producing those. Not too much later, maybe I forget how many months later, I heard of Clooney, and Clooney said, hey, if you are someone who is interested in bringing books, good Catholic books that have either gone out of print or in danger of going out of print, contact us. Mm -hmm. And I said, hey, could we do Mr. Blue? And they said, well, yeah, we'll have to contact the family and see what the deal is with that. And I said, you know, I, when I was reading it, I've done a little bit of the research and there's not a lot of scholarship on the book. In fact, there's almost none. I'm thinking there's a lot to say about this book from a scholarly point of view because Connolly weaves all kinds of theological, spiritual, historical, regional details into this book that make it something more than a devotional book. I think this is actually a work of literature. And I said to them, how about doing what we call a critical edition, a critical introduction and annotations? And they said, yeah, let's try it. And we did that, and we, you know, the Connolly estate saw it, and we just heard from Mary, and she saw it. She's like, "Okay, you know, nobody's done this in my father's work before. We're very, uh, this is, we're really happy to see this. Let's keep going with it." And that's it. Went from there. You know, and that sounds so odd to me, given that it was a book read by so many 
you know, students yeah. in college and high school for so many years, yeah. and that there was not that kind of research on it. Because this is not just, you know, a fluff novel. Mm -mm. It's, it's, it's got real depth. To oh, it. yeah. And I did find a few things, uh, you know, from the 50s and the 60s. And, mm -hmm. I, and as I read those, I found a, a theme, and that is a lot of very good aesthetic commentators, people who write critically about novels as novels, saw Mr. Blue as a kind of bookmark, a cultural bookmark, as in, this is what a good book looks like that treats Catholicism reverently, mm. but nonetheless does not try to uh, dumb it down to devotion. Neither dumb it down nor beat you over the head with right, it. Right, exactly. You right. know, a, a good piece of art will give you this sense without it being a Punch and Judy show <laughs> where somebody's clobbering you over the head with right. doctrine. Right. It, it, it takes a fine artist to do that. Yeah. I'd like to give another quote sure. from Miles Colony. It was um, from uh, a column in Columbia Magazine back in 1928. Mm. He had uh, a great little insight here. He said, love should begin at home, truly, but it's a small love and worth little that ends there. It is not always the fool that wears his heart on his sleeve. It may well be the saint. Mm. And you know that's that's a wonderful knowledge, you know, a sense that the love of family, mm. uh, which he had very deeply. Very. You know, loving his wife and his children, um, he you know certainly had that love of family, but he took it out to the world in writing and in making film, and that's that's very important. Yeah, absolutely. the The book that most has that element to it is the Bump on Brannigan's Head, which was the first book he published after Mr. Blue. Mr. Blue is twenty eight. Bump on Brannigan's Head is nineteen fifty. He had been working in Hollywood during that time. And the bump on Brannigan's head reads a lot. You can see it cinematically. You can mm -hmm. tell he was writing screenplays. Every scene, there's not a wasted word. It happens like a scene by scene, shot by shot of a film. Yeah. But it's about a family and what happens when love is not taken outside the family. Yeah. It's okay. exactly what that happens. Cool. And he does it. Well, look, you can read more of Dr. Mirachi's work by going to excorde.org. And you can also get Miles Connolly's books at ClooneyMedia.com. ClooneyMedia.com. Doctor, we thank you very much Thanks for so much being for me, here with us. Great to have you yeah. and for presenting this book. Yeah. And may the Lord bless you and our audience, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. And we can bring Dr. Mirachi and all the other guests and other programs here because the network is brought to you by you. That's how Mother was inspired to have this work. So please remember to keep us in between your gas bill, your electric bill, mm -hmm. and your cable bill, and we'll be able to pay our bills too. God bless and thank you.